This case was suggested by one of our listeners, so thank you, Angel, from Instagram. Today's episode is about the vicious murder of 15-year-old schoolgirl Paige Doherty in Clyde Bank, who was on her way to her part-time job in a hairdresser's. She had her whole life ahead of her and had so many plans, but on Saturday the 19th of March 2016, her young life would be cut short. Clyde Bank is a town in Western Bartonshire, situated on the banks of the River Clyde and about six and a half miles northwest of Glasgow. In 2012, the population was estimated as being 26,640. A few famous people you may have heard of originate from Clyde Bank, such as Duncan Bannantyne, Kevin Bridges, and pop band Wet 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 was formed in Clyde Bank in 1982. Clyde Bank is also home to a 150-foot high crane called the Titan, which was used for lifting heavy equipment during the fitting out of battleships and ocean liners. Paige lived in the White Crook area of Clyde Bank with her family, Mum Pamela and stepdad Andy, two younger brothers, Andrew who was 10, and Lucas who was three months old, and one younger sister, Peyton, who was four. Pamela and Paige's biological father, John, who lived about a 29-minute drive away from his daughter, had split up before Paige was born. John and Pamela both got on with their lives separately. John had a new family not long after Paige's birth and he did not play a part in Paige's life. Andy, Paige's stepfather, came into her life when she was four years old. She doted on her stepdad, and when she was 14 years old, she showed just how much on Father's Day, when she said on Facebook, Happy Father's Day, Dad, to the best guy out. Even though we argue 24-7, you're always there for me, and always will be, and I have your back too. You've been with us since I was four, and it's honestly been the best thing that's ever happened to me. And my mum loves you to pieces and is so happy. Love you lots and lots. Have a great day, Andy Monroe. Paige loved her family. She would regularly take her younger siblings swimming into the cinema, as well as buy them wee presents when she got paid from her Saturday job every week, and her siblings just doted on their big sister. Paige's grandmother said that she was a kind, selfless person and an all-round good girl. Paige was well known in the area and known to be a bubbly, friendly girl. Pamela had Paige when she was about 17 years old and they were very close. Paige's passion was beauty and hairdressing. She always had to have the latest makeup and took lots of photos of herself for social media. She was also popular at school and had lots of friends, but her best friend was Lauren. On Friday the 18th of March, Paige decided that she was going to stay at her friend Lauren's house for the night and go to her part-time job in a hairdresser's straight from her friend's house on the Saturday morning. Paige spent some time with her family on the Friday evening before saying bye to her mum Pamela at about 10.15pm and then headed to Lauren's house for the night. The girls no doubt spent some time on social media as well as chatting, laughing and listening to music before eventually getting some sleep. And then on Saturday morning, Paige left Lauren's house just after 8am for the five-minute walk to Fleming Avenue, where she went to get a breakfast roll from the deli there. Like every other Saturday morning, she would then walk about five minutes to the nearest bus stop to start her journey to work, firstly travelling into Glasgow and then on to Kirkintilloch, which is about 13 miles away from Clyde Bank and north-east of Glasgow, where her part-time hairdressing job was. Paige couldn't wait to leave school and go on to work as a hairdresser. However, in Kirkintilloch on Saturday the 19th of March, Paige's start time at the hairdressers came and went, and Paige did not arrive. Back in Clyde Bank, Paige's boyfriend was becoming concerned as he had not heard from his girlfriend that morning, which was unusual. So he called the hairdressers to see if Paige was okay. When he spoke to her colleagues, however, he grew even more concerned as Paige had not turned up for work. Paige was a very reliable person and wouldn't just not turn up. Something clearly was wrong. So her boyfriend contacted Paige's mum, Pamela, to see if she had spoken to Paige that morning. Pamela advised that she had not heard from Paige that morning either, which also was unusual as Paige always would text her mum to say hi. Pamela tried and tried to get hold of Paige in her mobile, but there was no answer. Where was Paige? As concern grew, Paige's mum, Pamela, contacted the police and a missing persons inquiry began. 
This was a harrowing time for both Paige's family and her friends, and they felt they needed to do something to help find Paige. And so friends and family set up a Facebook page, appealing for any information on Paige's whereabouts. Thousands of posters were also produced and distributed in the local area. Searching for any information she could on Paige's whereabouts, Paige's mum Pamela went into the delicious deli in Fleming Avenue on Sunday to speak to the owner, John Letham, knowing that Paige went to the deli every Saturday morning to get a breakfast roll. John wasn't in the shop, but a member of staff there got John on the phone to ask him if he'd seen Paige that Saturday morning. At first, John didn't seem to know who either Paige or Pamela were, but eventually he placed them both and advised that yes, Paige had come into the shop that morning and she'd bought a roll and then left. John also said to the staff member on the phone to him to say to Pamela that she was welcome to come round to his house later and he would tell her everything he knew. Pamela declined as she didn't know John very well and didn't even know where he stayed, but to thank him all the same. So this information was a starting point. Pamela now knew that Paige must have gone missing after she'd been in the deli on the Saturday. What could have happened between the deli and the five-minute walk she would have taken to get to the bus stop? Following the missing person inquiry being opened, the police appealed to the public for any information on the whereabouts of Paige, giving a description of Paige as being a slim schoolgirl of 4 foot 8 inches with long dark hair who had been wearing a dark jacket, white top, blue jeans and white night trainers when she went missing. Paige's mum also made an appeal directly to Paige, saying that she wasn't in any trouble and no one was angry, just that everyone was worried about her safety and just to come home. Following these appeals, a nearby shop owner provided more useful information to the police. At the time, there were five terraced shops on Fleming Avenue. At one end was Fleming Gift Shop and Fleming Food Store, and at the other end was the delicious deli owned by John Letham. Following the appeal for information about Paige's movements on Saturday the 19th of March in the morning, the police learned from the owner of Fleming Food Store, Ashi Ahmed, that he had actually waved to Paige that Saturday morning, about 8.15am, as she passed his shop on her way to the delicious deli. So the police had more confirmation that Paige had indeed made it to the deli and the deli owner had seen her leave, so whatever happened to her must have happened after she left the deli. Gulzar Ahmed was the owner of Fleming Gift Shop and he had installed a high-quality CCTV camera which covered all of the five shops. It ran 24 hours a day and kept the last 12 days' worth of footage. So maybe footage from this CCTV would reveal what happened to Paige after she had left the deli. However, about 12.45pm on Monday the 21st of March, two days after Paige went missing and before the CCTV footage could be reviewed, a man out walking came across a body in a wooded area behind a path off Great Western Road, which is a busy road between Clydebank and Glasgow. This was also about half a mile from where Paige was last seen alive, walking towards the deli. It was confirmed by the Senior Investigating Officer, Detective Superintendent Duncan Sloan, on Tuesday the 22nd of March, that the body found was that of Paige Doherty, that a murder inquiry had been launched, and the police were appealing again for any information on Paige's movements on Saturday the 19th of March. This was absolutely devastating news for Paige's family. But through her grief, Pamela, Paige's mum, still found the strength to post a brief message on the Facebook page that had been set up when Paige had initially gone missing. She said, Myself and Andy Monroe would like to thank everyone for their support and help in trying to find our daughter. Unfortunately, we can confirm that it is our beautiful girl Paige who was found in Clyde Bank. Again, thank you for all your support. I am seeing everyone's messages, but understandably, we have a lot on our minds and can't reply. We are absolutely devastated, as will many people be who know her. Following the discovery of the body, roads near the area were cordoned off and forensic teams began searching the area. The police proceeded to carry out door-to-door -door inquiries in and around the area in the hope that there had been a sighting of Paige to try to piece together her final movements, as well as reviewing CCTV footage in the area Paige's body was found and where she had last been seen alive. 
On the morning of Monday the 21st of March, before the body was found, police had approached Galzar Ahmed regarding the footage and had taken away three hours worth of footage from Saturday morning. Upon viewing this footage, they saw Page walking on Fleming Avenue on the Saturday morning, walking past Fleming Foods and Fleming Gift Shop and walking straight into Delicious Deli. They continued to watch the three-hour footage, but in this time, they did not see Page leaving the deli. And so at this point, the police had more questions than answers. And so, on the morning of Wednesday the 23rd of March, police returned to Golzar Ahmed's gift shop and requested to take away the entire CCTV footage, which had been 12 days' worth, and then proceeded to review this footage. Police had also searched CCTV footage from around the area Page's body had been found and a car had been spotted near the same area at about 6am on the 21st of March. This was of great interest to the police. And upon reviewing both sets of footage, a picture began to emerge of just what had happened to 15-year-old Paige Doherty. Now, while the police were investigating Paige's murder, obviously her friends and family were struggling to come to terms with what was happening. So in order to feel like they were doing something to help, Paige's friends set up a crowdfunding campaign in order to help Paige's family pay for her funeral. Apparently, this campaign received more than £14,000, or about $18,500, only a day after it was set up. Also in Paige's honour, a memorial was arranged by Paige's friends a few days after her murder. The memorial was attended by hundreds of people, many carrying pink balloons in Paige's honour. Paige's murder had shocked the community, but everyone pulled together to help one another including on the evening of the 24th of March, the Titan crane in Clyde Bank was lit up in pink in Paige's memory and to show support to everyone affected by the horrific murder. Paige's mum also started a Facebook page and the trend Pout for Paige, in which even Scotland's First Minister showed her support by posting a picture of herself pouting. It was so heartening to see the people of Clyde Bank and wider Scotland showing their support for Paige's family and friends. While the community were coming together to support each other, the police continued their investigation. Following the police reviewing the footage from Fleming Avenue of Paige walking into Delicious Deli on Saturday the 19th of March, but there being no footage of her coming out, John Letham was brought in for questioning. He was asked again if he had seen Paige that morning in his deli and he said yes, he had seen her that morning. They asked him what she'd seemed like that morning and he had said she seemed normal. He then stated that after Paige buying her roll and sausage, she had left the deli. However, now that the police had looked through the entire footage from Fleming Avenue, they knew there was no footage of Paige leaving. Due to the overwhelming evidence that Paige had entered the deli but had not come out, on Wednesday the 23rd of March, the police descended again on Fleming Avenue, this time cordoning off the delicious deli. Forensic officers carried out extensive searches in the deli, as well as at John Letham's house near the deli in Brown Avenue and his car. When the police put it to John Letham that they believed something had happened to Paige in the delicious deli and that forensic officers were searching the premises, he continued to deny any knowledge of Paige's disappearance and subsequent murder, going as far as saying that the forensic teams would not find any of Paige's blood in his deli. However, despite the fact that there had obviously been an attempt to clean any blood from the deli, the forensic teams were quick to find Paige's blood in the back office of the deli, on the walls, on a fridge, between the floorboards, and on removing the floorboards, spots of Paige's blood were also found. While John Letham continued to deny knowing anything about Paige's disappearance or death, the evidence just kept mounting up against him. Finally, though, upon being presented with all the evidence against him, he did admit to killing 15-year-old Paige. And on Thursday the 24th of March 2016, five days after Paige disappeared, John Letham was arrested on suspicion of murdering Paige. He appeared in Dumbarton Sheriff Court on the 26th of March for a private hearing and was charged with Paige's murder, where he made no plea and was to remain in custody and to appear in court at a later date. John Letham was 31 years old at the time. He was married to Cassia and they had a new baby daughter. He also had a nine-year-old daughter from a previous relationship who was also called Paige, 
and before he was arrested for Page's murder, he told a newspaper reporter that he would hate it if anything happened to his daughter. Cassia refused to believe her husband's guilt and stood by him, visiting him in prison and believing that he would be cleared of all charges. Page's post-mortem was carried out on the 24th of March and only then were Page's family able to actually have a viewing of her. However, there were so many stipulations and they were only allowed 10 minutes with her. They were told that in order for Page's body to remain as intact as possible, they were not allowed to spend any more time with her and were certainly not allowed to touch her or hold her. This was in case the defence wanted to perform a second post-mortem, and they were given 110 days to do this. In fact, Paige's body was the property of the Crown and not her family. Following the post-mortem, Paige's death certificate said that she had died from sharp force injuries to her neck. Paige's family were finally able to give Paige a funeral she would have been so proud of on the 20th of April three days after what would have been her 16th birthday. The service took place at St Margaret's Church in Clyde Bank. Pamela, Paige's mum, had said to family and friends to turn their anger at Paige's death into cherishing the memory of her beautiful, smiling girl. She wanted to see smiles that day to remember Paige. No tears, just happy memories of Paige. A beautiful video of Paige's family and friends paying tribute to Paige was played during the service. Following the service, Paige's coffin was transported to its final resting place by horse-drawn carriage, with a pink floral star placed on the top of the carriage. Paige's final resting place eventually got its headstone on the 8th of March 2018, over two years after her funeral. Pamela said on Facebook that this had been a day she hadn't wanted to face and had found this extremely hard. Pamela has asked that the headstone be for family and friends only, something just for them, and to please not share any pictures of it. Now, even before Paige's family had the ordeal of attending the High Court to hear John Lethem's plea and him being sentenced for his crime, there were a lot of awful rumours going round the community that there was more to John Lethem and Paige's relationship than met the eye. It was suggested that they had actually been seeing each other and that she might even have been pregnant. Not only did the family have to go through the pain of losing Paige, but they also had to listen to these horrible rumours. However, every line of inquiry had to be looked into, so the police carried out an investigation into these claims. After extensively checking Paige's mobile phone records, social media posts, emails, and collecting CCTV footage of any of her visits to the deli, there was absolutely nothing to suggest that Paige and John Lethem had been having any kind of relationship. And as there had been a post-mortem on Paige's body, the rumour that she had been pregnant was immediately ruled out as just gossip. She was just a wee girl living her young life. While Pamela kept herself busy with honouring Paige any way she could and keeping her name on everyone's lips, more pain was yet to come as on the 5th of September 2016, Paige's family and friends attended the High Court in Glasgow where John Lethem pleaded guilty to Paige's murder. During the hearing, not only did Paige's family and friends have to listen to the horrendous attack that took place on Paige, but they also had to listen to John Lethem's attempts at justifying what he had done to her. Paige had entered the deli that morning at about 8.21am to buy her breakfast roll. Apparently, John Lethem had then invited Paige through to the back office to discuss a job application. According to John Lethem, Paige had started to fill out the application form and he had noticed from her date of birth that she was only 15 and so he had said to her that he would need to discuss the job with her mum as she was under age. And again, according to John Lethem, Paige had then said that if he didn't give her the job at his deli, she would say that he had touched her. Bearing in mind, of course, that Paige already had a part-time job in a hairdresser's, a profession that she herself wanted to pursue when she left school so there would be absolutely no reason for her to be looking for a job in any other line of work. However, according to John Lethem, upon hearing this from Paige, he panicked as he had a relative that was on the sex offenders register and he knew that they had had nothing but problems since and he didn't want to be put on the register himself. And so, in his apparently panicked state, he grabbed a knife and repeatedly stabbed Paige. 
However, in the attack, it wasn't just a knife that he used. Apparently, he had attacked Paige with other weapons, thought to be a screwdriver and scissors, although none of the weapons used were ever found. There were a few different accounts of what John Letham had actually done to Paige. The newspapers stated that Paige had 61 stab wounds to her face, head and neck, and a further 85 slashes also to her face, head and neck, with a few lacerations on her arms where she had obviously tried to defend herself. However, the true extent of Paige's injuries were still to be revealed. John Letham's advocate did concede that the attack on Paige had been a gross overreaction, while Judge Lady Ray, the judge presiding over the case, said that it had been a savage, frenzied attack and was truly reprehensible. The main evidence, and most damning, in the court case was the CCTV obtained by the police. Firstly, the footage from Fleming Food Store showing Paige going into the deli and not coming out. Ten minutes later, the CCTV showed that the shutters to the deli were pulled down. Then, just over an hour and a half later, it showed John Letham running to Fleming Food Store, where he bought antibacterial wipes, bin bags and bleach, before running back to the deli. Then, just a few minutes later, it shows John Letham walking to his car, which was parked across from the deli, and making space in the boot of his car. John Letham is then seen carrying a black bag to his car and dumping it roughly into the open boot. Apparently, you can see a foot with a white sock protruding from the bag. This was Paige. John Letham then drives away, where he apparently went to his home, where he put Paige's body in his garden shed, where he kept her until the Monday morning when he dumps her body at 6am. His car is seen at 6am on CCTV in the area Paige's body was found. And shockingly, after John Letham had removed Paige's body from the deli and placed it in his shed, he then went back to the deli and continued to serve customers until 3.15pm that day. He then returned to the deli again at 6.04pm and was seen on CCTV from inside the deli tidying up and carrying plastic bags. There actually was a CCTV camera inside the deli in the front where customers were served. But apparently when the police asked John Letham for any footage of the time period when Paige would have been in the shop, it had mysteriously disappeared. Although thankfully the police were able to recover it. And then on Sunday, the day after he had brutally murdered Paige, John Letham carried on with his life as normal and went on a day trip with his wife and baby. Upon hearing the evidence against John Letham and him pleading guilty to Page's murder, he was then taken back to prison to await his sentencing, which took place at the Crown Court on the 12th of October 2016, with Page's family and friends also present. However, before sentencing, John Letham's advocate asked that any sentence given take into account the fact that John Letham had never had any previous convictions and he had shown genuine remorse. However, this was rejected and John Letham was sentenced to a minimum of 27 years in jail before being eligible for parole due to the fact that it had been such a brutal killing and because he had hidden the body. Judge Lady Ray said that she would have sentenced John Letham to 30 years if it hadn't been for his early plea. A clear relief was felt in the courtroom that day that justice had been done and Paige's family and friends vented their anger towards John Letham as he was taken from court in handcuffs. Outside of the court, after the sentencing, Pamela gave a statement, saying that, Today we see a monster put behind bars for the unthinkable brutal crime he committed against our daughter, Paige. There is no sentence high enough to justify what has happened, but we can say now there is one less evil man in this world, which makes the world that bit more safe for our kids to grow up in. She went on to say that her and her family are taking each day at a time. There is a huge piece missing in our family that can never be replaced. I am thankful for the 15 years we had with Paige. From the kind and generous wee soul she was, to the mature young woman she grew into. She may not be with us any more, but she will live on through her brothers and sister, and all the memories that we share. Pamela went on to say that the family now needs space to try to collect their thoughts and start to rebuild their lives, as the case had been exhausting for them all. 
John Latham's wife, Cassia, finally realised that her husband and father of her child was a murderer and he would be spending a long time behind bars. She left Scotland and returned to her hometown in Poland with her young daughter, who she stayed with her mum and dad. However, that was not the end of Paige's family and friends' torture, as later in October, John Letham appealed his sentencing. Following the launch of John Letham's appeal, Paige's family set up a Justice for Paige Facebook page, which campaigned against the proceedings. This is when Pamela finally revealed the actual extent of the attack against Paige. She said she hated to have to reveal the exact details, but she felt she needed to, as she believed John Letham should not have his sentence reduced. John Letham, in a state of panic, had attacked a 15-year-old girl so savagely that her nose was broken and her eye had been slit straight across. She also had a hole the size of a man's fist on the left side of her neck from where she had been repeatedly stabbed. Apparently, there was not much left of the left side of her neck. Pamela believes that Paige had actually been stabbed in the region of 500 times. Pamela also said that most of the injuries were to the left side of Paige's face and neck and that the right side of her face had been untouched in the attack. John Letham's appeal hearing took place two days before Christmas in 2016, where John Letham's solicitors stated that his sentence of 27 years was excessive, saying that his sentence was higher than similar cases. No outcome was given at this hearing, so Paige's family had this hanging over them all over Christmas, as well as the heartbreak of not having Paige around. However, finally, in February 2017, the appeal court made a decision. It had been decided that the length of punishment had not been consistent with the current sentencing practices and was excessive. Given it had been John Letham's first offence, that he was a family man, that it had not been premeditated, and because he had expressed remorse. The original sentence of 27 years was quashed, and John Letham was given a new sentence, now to spend at least 23 years in prison before being eligible for parole. This was devastating news for Paige's family and friends. They were shocked and saddened by the reduction in John Letham's sentence. A spokesperson for the Justice for Page Facebook page said that The man who brutally murdered a 15-year-old defenceless child has been given more time off his sentence. He will only have to serve 23 years. There are no words to describe how we feel. It's heartbreaking and serves no justice to Page and her family. She had her whole life ahead of her and it's been ripped apart. In 23 years, her killer will walk the streets. Following this devastating blow, the Justice for Page Facebook page then began to look at a possible change in the law, which, if passed by the Scottish Parliament, would limit the amount of time a post-mortem examination could be carried out, so no other family of a murder victim would have to go through the same nightmare as Page's of not being able to bury their loved one until the defence had given the OK, and they had 110 days to do this. However, in January 2021, it was reported that the law bill, called Page's Law, had failed, leaving families this had affected extremely disappointed and feeling let down. On the 3rd of October 2016, Page's heartbroken family placed a plaque on the wall outside the deli where Page was killed as a memorial. It reads, Page Doherty. 1704-2000 to 1903-2016, Glasgow's Angel, remembered with a smile. Since that time, Pamela has not slipped into the background and kept quiet. She continues to speak about Paige, Paige's murder, and of honouring Paige any way she can. Pamela said that Paige had left behind an unfinished bucket list, and she would be completing it on behalf of her daughter to keep her memory alive. On Paige's bucket list were things such as travelling to Barbados and New York, learning to drive, meeting Amy Childs, the reality star from the TV programme Towie, getting a tattoo and having her eyebrows tattooed on. Pamela admitted that she wasn't too keen on having her eyebrows tattooed. Paige's bucket list was starting to be checked off, as in November 2017, Pamela and her son Andrew travelled to New York. Andrew and Paige had always wanted to go to New York, 
and it had been planned that Andrew, Pamela and Paige would go to New York to celebrate Paige and Andrew's birthdays. But sadly, Paige was murdered before this could happen. On the 10th of May 2017, the family received some good news and hope in their lives. Andy, Paige's stepdad, and Pamela, Paige's mum, welcomed a baby girl into their family. They named her Penny Margaret Page after her big sister. Pamela, Page's mum, has always wanted to help others that have or are going through the same that she had gone through. So on the 18th of August 2017, the charity Page's Promise was registered by her family in the hope that the charity would be able to teach children self-defence and support families who have lost loved ones through grief counselling and taking families on short breaks away from everything to start to heal and be with people who understand their pain. In order to again raise awareness and also to raise money for the charity, a Pages Promise Ball was held in Glasgow on the 14th of April 2019. This would have been three days before Pages' 18th birthday. The Pages Promise Ball was a huge event. It was held at the Hilton Hotel in Glasgow and special guests included DJs George Bowie and Xander Nation, podcaster James English, singer Jane Henderson and the event was hosted by DJ Susie McGuire. For Paige's actual 18th birthday on the 17th of April, the family celebrated quietly with a large family dinner. Pamela said that she actually bought Paige the birthday presents that she would have bought her if she had still been alive except for the Range Rover that Paige had desperately wanted. The family then auctioned the gifts off for the charity. This is a gesture that has stuck with Paige's family and they continue to buy birthday and Christmas presents for Paige, again either giving them away to charity or to women's aid. And this is something that Pamela said they will do for the rest of their lives as she won't have Paige being missed out. Following the success of Paige's Ball in 2018, the charity hosted another ball on the 23rd of March 2019. This was another success with a huge turnout. Unfortunately, due to COVID, the ball in 2020 had to be cancelled. However, in January 2020, Pamela announced that she would be starting a mammoth 5,000-mile challenge walking the length and breadth of Scotland, where she would plant Paige's Promise flags along her route, which had the names of lost loved ones from other families on each flag. In April 2022, the charity Paige's Promise held another fundraising event, which was to mark what would have been Paige's 21st birthday and this time they hope to raise money to support not only others who have or are going through the same as Paige's family, but also to support men's mental health. The Paige's Promise charity is always arranging events and activities, including a ladies' afternoon tea on a bus tour, which is an aid of any woman who had experienced sudden loss, a kilt walk and hill walking. Paige's mum, Pamela, also did an interview with James English, who is the host of the podcast Anything Goes. In this interview, Pamela gave an insight into exactly what she went through from when Paige went missing to her body being found and how her life has been since her daughter was taken away from her so violently. Pamela also said on the podcast that she will never forgive John Letham for what he did to Paige and described his sentence as a total joke, saying that he deserved to rot in prison but instead he will be free to get on with his life in 20 years. Pamela also said that she would like to sit down with John Letham face to face and ask him why he killed her wee girl. She said she has written to John Letham repeatedly, asking him why he did what he did and asking for a visit with him. However, he has never replied. As I said earlier, Paige was estranged from her biological dad, John Bothwell. However, the savage murder of his daughter laid heavily on his mind and heart. And sadly, on Saturday the 25th of August 2018, he died. He had been taken to hospital after becoming unwell, but had slipped into a coma and had passed away. John's mother apparently felt that John had died from a broken heart. John was a boxer, and he had apparently struggled to come to terms with the fact that he had not been there to protect his daughter, and it had haunted him terribly. John was 37 years old when he died. Sadly, Pamela and Paige's stepdad Andy split up. However, Pamela is now happily in love with her new partner Alan and in April 2020 they welcomed a baby boy into the world. 
Since arriving in prison, John Lethem has not been a very popular man. In November 2016, he had to be moved from HMP Low Moss to HMP Dumfries, as it was discovered that other prisoners were plotting to kill him. Two days after he arrived in HMP Dumfries, he was punched in the head and face by another prisoner. And apparently, John Lethem continues to live in fear for his life and is scared he will be attacked again. Pamela and Paige's promise never stops trying to help others who find themselves in similar heartbreaking situations that Pamela found herself in. Pamela never stops telling Paige's story and she never stops celebrating Paige's life. Pamela has chosen to continue to turn her grief and loss into something positive and do all she can to be there for others in their time of grief, all the while keeping Paige's memory alive.